So let's get started, shall we? All right, so the first thing we're going to do is just look at economics as a discipline, uh, economists, what they do, and economic models. And then we're going to talk about two different types of models, one which is uh, a longer term uh, type model, in particular uh, relating to economic growth. And we're going to apply this to a case study in particular related to uh, Chinese uh, uh, economic miracle. Um, and it's one that, I, that I've used for the last couple of years at CUHK when I've been adjunct professor. Um, and then what we're going to do is then switch gears, um, and I won't expect you to follow it completely, but we're going to switch gears to shorter term models, which really sort of look at analyzing the COVID-19 event, and then bring those two together and draw some conclusions to answer the particular question here that we've posed, is that whether China can reset its growth profile back to the glory days. So let's get started, shall we? So look, you know, what is economics? Lyle Robbins probably had the best definition in the 1930s, which says economics is a science that studies human behavior as a relationship between limited resources and unlimited wants which have alternative uses. What this means is that economics is about allocating resources as most efficiently as possible and making decisions that allocate resources as efficiently as possible. Probably the most high profile economist in history was John Maynard Keynes and a great uh, hero of mine, particularly since he really founded what modern macroeconomics is all about. And he defines in this paragraph, and I'm sure you can get a copy of this after the lecture, I won't um, read through this, but there's a couple of points I wanna highlight here about how what he defined as being the master economist. Now master economist has to have a good combination of gifts a mathematician, a historian, a statesman, um, to some degree, to understand symbols and speak in words. That means you need to be able to be abstract, to think, and where abstraction comes in is in building models. So models have assumptions, okay? And so what we need to do is, is that we need to be abstract in terms of our model, relate it to the real world, look at the data, draw conclusions and then have a forward looking view on what the implications are and how relevant it is to sort of you know, the current the current environment. And so what kind of economics do and the models do we like? So look, this really depends on the time frame and the purpose of what we're actually looking at. So if you're looking at 50 to 20, five to 20 years, I should say, then growth models, which look at structural trends, you know, things like of you know, factor inputs like capital and labor and natural resources. They look at, at, at productivity, total factor productivity and technology, and in particular sort of, you know, the role of, of, of innovation. You know, China's investing a lot at the moment, you know, in AI and big data and so on. And that really relates to sort of, you know, some of the sort of the, the, the exciting sort of long-term structural drivers in the Chinese, the Chinese economy. So that's sort of looking at sort of the, the big sort of, you know, long-term picture uh, type models. In order to understand economic shocks like the global financial crisis, like the Asia crisis, like COVID-19, um, the trade war, for example, we need to use shorter term models. And the types of models that we will sort of look at here uh, include aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and ISLM which looks at, which is excellent actually at looking at both monetary and fiscal policy implications um, and analyzing those, 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 those particular shocks. So as I mentioned previously, we'll spend a little bit of time since we're in this speed dating time frame of 30 minutes um, to sort of build some of the intuition in the growth theory, applying it to, to, to China, and then look at some of these shorter term models in order to try to sort of address this particular question of about how bad is this COVID-19 shock? What are the authorities doing about it? And is it likely to, to, to lead to a major reset? Or is, um, is this likely to be sort of a, you know, a protracted problem for China and the rest of the world? So just a couple of definitional things. GDP, gross domestic product, it's the value of all final goods. This doesn't include goods along the way in the, in the supply chain. It's final goods uh, that are produced within a country in a given period of time. Now, when we look at GDP, we're looking at an important equation that comes up 
right from first year undergraduate to even in my PhD studies in dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models and financial frictions. And that is a simple equation which says that income equals expenditure. Okay, so income is the left-hand side of this equation. Why? And the right-hand side is those components of, of, of the domestic and international economy. C standing for consumption, I investment, G government spending, and NX being net exports, exports minus imports. It's gonna come up a lot in our discussion, even though it's 30 minutes. All right, so GDP and GDP growth. So, GDP, so economic growth is the change, the rate of change in real GDP over time. Now, GDP doesn't grow in a linear fashion, as we've seen very recent here, recently here, uh, it gets interrupted by major disruptive events like COVID-19, like the global financial crisis, uh, like the Great Depression. And so we get on occasions these big dislocations that lead to sort of large drops in GDP. And GDP in China in the first quarter of this year has dropped by 6.8%. In this quarter in the United States, it'll be dropping by over double digits. You know, unemployment in the United States right now is arguably around 15 to 20 to 20 percent. These are big dislocations and a big and rapid change that's taken place as opposed to December of last year when the world was in full employment and where unemployment was near an all-time low. So COVID-19 has had a big impact. Now when we look at sort of you know the historic growth profile, China has been top of the leaderboard you know for a number of years. So between 1970 and 2015, China has outgrown most of the world, and particularly for a large economy, it's done so. In fact, when we look at between 1978 and 2012, the glory days, if you like, of Chinese growth, it averaged over 10%, or around 10, around 10%. That is extraordinary and unprecedented. So what are the things sort of, you know, by the, some of the sort of concepts behind economic growth? Now, productivity is a very important concept. So this is the quantity of goods and services produced per unit of labor. And the growth in productivity or productivity growth is actually a very important determinant in growth in real GDP and living standards over time. And so we're going to show that how boosting capital can actually increase labor productivity, but there are constraints on this. And China might be facing some of those constraints. So what are the determinants of productivity? These are the inputs into what's known as our production function, okay? So there's the physical capital per unit, that's machinery, that's spending in IT, for example. There's human capital, that's us as, 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 as workers. It's the investment that we make in our education, such as doing an MBA. There's natural resources, that availability of natural resources, and technical knowledge and innovation changes in production processes, new techniques, and so on, that can boost productivity over time. So we won't go into the math, but look, basically, and we, we keep math at a, at, a, at a minimum in these MBA courses, and what we try to do is to develop the, 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 the concepts um, intuitively as possible. But we have an economy-wide production function, which is Y equals A times a function of capital and labor. A is your total factor productivity, which is technological innovation that boosts production and economic growth per unit of capital or labor. So like robotics, you know, artificial intelligence, big data, uh, the internet was a massive contribution uh, to, uh, to total factor productivity and so on and so forth. And then we've got this production function that turns people and capital into, 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 produ into, into production. And so this is a very simplistic way of sort of looking at how growth actually takes place and what the inputs are. But we won't go into the math, but this final line here shows that what we can do, and I'll show you an empirical example using China uh, in particular. It shows that GDP growth can be broken down into the capital contribution, the labor contribution, and total factor productivity growth. Now, that's, well, this is important in China's case because China has invested greatly over the past 10 years in physical capital. And as far as the labor contribution is concerned, we need to take care of consideration of certain things like the effects of the one child policy, which has shrunk the rate of growth in population. In fact, the population 
uh, growth is shrinking to the point where the so-called labor force participation rate is actually dropping. The percentage of people of productive age between 16 and 60 is shrinking in China. And in fact, the labor force as a whole is going to shrink over the course of the next 20 years. That's important when we're thinking about growth. And total factor productivity growth, I said, in order to offset some of these factors, China's investing heavily in, in areas such as AI, big data, et cetera, to try to offset the constraints that it faces with structural constraints that it faces with capital and labor. So this diagram is a simplified version of what's known as the neoclassical growth model. So on the vertical axis, we've got output per unit of labor, Y divided by L. On the horizontal axis, we've got capital per unit of labor. And what this shows is that if you look at the, the green uh, arrows and then if you look at the red arrows, is that if we increase, if you start off you're an economy that already has a small amount of capital, like the green case, any incremental amount of capital that you add to your economy boost your economic growth greatly. But if you notice that there's a concavity to this curve and that by the time you've invested a significant amount where the ratio of investment to GDP is sufficiently high, then you get much less bang for your buck. So one unit of capital only pays you back a small amount of economic growth. And the real question is, where does China fit on this line? Now I can tell you, North Korea, fits right down the bottom here, right towards the left. A bit of, of foreign direct investment in North Korea is going to rapidly boost growth in that country. But will it in China? It's a real question. We'll answer this in a moment. We're going to relate this to the long-term growth profile. And that is the background before we start to understand COVID-19 and to understand sort of the context of where this all comes from. So look at, if we look at the investment share of G20 economies, we can see that, and this is investment divided by GDP, we can see that China is at the top of the list, 50%. That is extraordinarily high. What that means is, is that China is way high up on this particular curve. And so what it's facing is what's known as diminishing returns to capital. This is a structural constraint that cannot be offset, okay? That is written in stone. What the Chinese authorities can do is try to shift this curve inward by increasing total factor productivity. But what it cannot do is bring China back down this curve so it's back into that period like North Korea or a, a lesser developed country that, um, that can experience high degree of growth just by throwing capital at it, just by building infrastructure. That period has come and gone. Okay. So if we look um, at, uh, if we move on, ahead uh, to case studies. And I just saw a question pop up. What I'm gonna do is with these questions, I'm gonna run through this as quickly as I can, speed dating style. And, um, and I'll answer questions either online or at the very end in the Q&A questions session. So bear with me because I wanna finish everything I need to do if you don't mind. So case studies, all right. Now this is a key element of the way in which we teach in business schools. We teach theory, but what we try to do is make it relevant, right? We want to make it relevant. And what I do in my courses is that I don't use historic 10, 20 years ago cases. I look at stuff that's relevant today, right? We look at structural supply side reform, the COVID-19. We look at uh, we, we, we look at the, the impact of the reversal of the one child policy. Yeah, we look at the, um, the macro crisis in Venezuela. Uh, we look at Brexit and so on and so forth. Now, one of them we look at here, which really lays the foundation, it's a very good case study, which is called China's Miracle Economy, um, which, uh, which is sort of you know, behind some of the, the, the data in this. Now, China's growth-oriented policies were significant, were very well thought out, and had massive implications. Okay, so one of the key ones was the relaxation of the so-called hukou system that led to freeing up labor to move from rural areas to urban areas. This was huge. We've also had the privatization of state-owned enterprises, the formation of special economic zones. We've had financial liberalization such as the devalu such as um, eliminating sort of you know the dual currency system. 
um, liberalization in, uh, in trade by entering the World Trade Organization. And as I mentioned previously, a massive infrastructure builder. Okay. Now these policies um, have been done. They can't be done twice. Okay. So there needs to be new policies that will boost growth in order to sort of offset those policies in the past. And the real question is, is that whether China can actually do it. So if we look at the growth periods between that 1978 time and 2016, we can actually put this down to different administrations. So under Deng Xiaoping, between 1978 and 1992, after Mao Zedong, almost 10%. Under Jiang Zemin, between 92 and 2002, just under 10%. Hu Jintao, over 10%. Now, Xi Jinping, since he's come into office, this is until 2016. Last year was about 6%. That rate of growth is slow. Now, the reason why it's slowed is due to those structural reasons that we've talked about, okay? The point where the investment share of the economy is already very high, facing diminishing returns to capital, the effect of the uh, one-child policy, even though it's been reversed, has meant that fertility has not gone back to pre-one-child uh, levels, okay? Now, to reproduce the population, you need a fertility rate of 2.1. Now, we've seen the relaxation of the one-child policy, and the fertility, fertility rate is 1.6, not at the reproduction rate. So over time, we're going to see that labor force shrink and that labor force participation rate is going to be a drag on the economy. Now, some of this reason for this slowdown, and what I'm trying to do is sort of paint a picture as to, as to where we are leading into this COVID-19 shock and try to be realistic about what's possible at the other end of the tunnel is to understand this long-term model before we get onto some shorter-term models. And, and this is important. So this, remember before we looked at that, there was a little bit of math, and we saw that we could break down economic growth into the capital contribution, the labor contribution, and also total factor productivity growth. Here it is. And we can see there that leading up to 2007, up to the global financial crisis, we saw a huge contribution in total factor productivity. And we've seen that drop back over time. And in particular, a disappointment has been the labor contribution. The reason for that has been demographics, okay? The reason for that has been the aging of society, the shrinking of the labor force participation rate. And the constraint on the capital contribution to growth has been, has been because of the structural impediment due to overinvestment in the past. And so this diminishing returns to capital is a, genuine, is a genuine constraint. Now, how do we offset all this? The Chinese authorities are trying to boost total factor productivity. And with that, here is sort of the investment in AI, big data, robotics, and so on and so forth. All right. And so here we go. Here's a projected um, uh, view prior to COVID-19 of where growth is headed. And as you can see, the labor growth comp contribution is negative due to the demographic issues and overall growth is expected to slow to around 5%. Now, again, that's before COVID-19. So is it gonna go back to the glory base of 10%? Mm, it's looking tough. So as I mentioned previously, and I won't go into this into more detail, the issue with diminishing returns is, is that those big structural changes that, that took place in China over the past 30 years can't be done again. We can do some things around the edges, in particular regarding total factor productivity, but we can't turn back time. The other thing to bear in mind in China is that there is a deliberate focus on the quality of growth, okay? Now, previously, we saw massive growth that also had risk involved in it. This is why we've seen financial sector reform in China over the past three to, three to four years. And in that period, for example, after the global financial crisis, we saw a massive increase in infrastructure spending and credit creation that was double the average of the previous 10 years. That led to some risks that have presented themselves in the financial sector and why we've seen deleveraging in the financial sector through financial sector reform and reform focusing on the banking system, the shadow banking system, uh, the interbank lending market and the insurance sector. The other thing to bear in mind is, is that there is a concerted effort and has been for some time before the trade war with the US, before COVID-19, to shift China from a manufacturing and export focused model, 
to one that was more driven by domestic demand in particular consumption. Now, the reason for that is to make the Chinese economy less vulnerable to international shocks like a trade war. So that necessarily does imply a lower growth profile. So now we're into uh, the short-term models. Now here, there's a lot of work, a whole semester that builds up to this. So you're gonna have to trust me and work with me about how this works and what the implications are. Okay, so let's look at sort of the two big risks to China's growth path. Obviously the COVID-19 event, okay? We've seen, you know, first quarter over 6% decline in economic growth. In Q1 of 2020, the US economy um, uh, uh, declined 4.8. It'll be double digit this quarter. Unemployment is already extraordinarily high. This is of the order of magnitude of the Great Depression. Now, will it be like the Great Depression? I don't think so, because this is a deliberate shutdown of production and a hold back in, 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 in spending. The trade war is another factor and the disruption to supply chains is an ongoing factor that's not likely to be solved soon. So let's talk about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Now, again, there's a lot of theory that comes into this. So let's, let's go into, let's go into um, just uh, to try to give you a heuristic understanding here. Now, remember that, big, that production function we just talked about a moment ago. Y equals a, is A times a function of capital labor. That sort of long-term production function determines aggregate supply, okay? Aggregate supply or the total sort of um, um, uh, supply of produced goods and services in the economy doesn't get influenced by price over the near term. It's driven by those big long-term structural factors, which is why it's that vertical line going through A. Short-term aggregate supply is affected by prices, which is, which is part of the reason why we have an upward sloping curve. If prices for goods and services are higher, people want to produce more. Hence, production will be more so upward slope in the um, short-run aggregate supply curve. Aggregate demand is downwardly sloped. Obviously, if the price of goods is higher, we demand less of it. If the price of an iPhone is going to, is, is drops in half, well, I'm going to buy another one. I'm going to upgrade to a new model. Okay, so that's sort of where we are. And the aggregate demand curve itself is that equation we talked about before, y equals c plus i plus, plus, plus g plus nx. It's also known, it's also sort of relates to a concept called equilibrium in the goods market. Okay, so this is good for analyzing both demand and supply side shocks. And COVID-19, guess what? Gives us both a demand side shock and a supply side shock. So, um, Again, there's a lot of background here, but let's start off at our original equilibrium here, which is at point A, where we've got our original sort of aggregate demand curve and our long run aggregate supply and short run aggregate supply um, curve one at that point A. Now, the first thing is, is that COVID-19 is a shock to supply chains. We're seeing production shut down, right? So supply chains are cut off. That leads to a leftward shift in the aggregate supply curve to SRAS2, point B. But it's not just a supply side shock that's taken place, it's a demand side shock as well. And so the aggregate demand curve just shifted left to the point C. Now, if it was just a supply side shock, we'd have, you know, we'd have a bit of what's known as stagflation, i.e. prices would have increased from P star to P1, but we'd see a move away from our full employment. Our full employment was at that Y star. We were at full employment at the end of last year, and any deviation from Y star is unemployment. We would have, it would have had a small degree of unemployment, but no, we're at point C because we've had both a combination of a supply side shock and a demand side shock that's led us to this point. This is a big discrepancy. And what the real question is, and when we think about resets, is, is that if you close down businesses in China, in Wuhan, in Hong Kong, elsewhere in China or the United States or around the world long enough, then they're not necessarily going to reset and come back in the future. So the real question is, does the economy, does the Chinese economy adjust back to that Y star over time? Or is there structural damage that shifts that long run aggregate supply curve to the left? I suspect there's been some of that and this will take some time. So now we look at another model. Again, remember, if you take my course, you know, we will develop this over time, slowly but surely, and you'll get comfortable to all of it. We look, at, we look at the economy in a different space. Here, if you notice, we had the price 
level or inflation on the vertical axis, output on the, on the horizontal axis. Here we're looking at interest rates and output. And what this model here, the ISLM, IS re, uh, relates to um, uh, goods market equilibrium, that Y equals C plus I plus G plus, plus net, net exports, and money market equilibrium, which is where money supply equals money demand. And we look at this in terms of the effect on interest rates and output, real GDP, and we do this from the point of view of trying to understand, trying to understand what particular policies are taking place in order to try to offset these, these, these particular um, problems. So the LM curve here, which is an upward sloping curve, we don't have time to derive it, um, reflects monetary policy. So this week, we saw the triple R, the reserve rate requirement, cut dramatically in China. This is a design designed to boost money supply. We've had several cuts in the official interest rates by the PBOC. This is designed to boost money supply. When you have a boosting money supply, that LM curve moves to the right. We have a tight monetary policy, it moves to the left. Now with the IS curve, this is good at analyzing fiscal policy. What happens when we get a tax cut? That IS curve shifts to the right. When we get a tax hike, it moves to the left. So let's have a look at the shock and let's have a look at the response. So in this model, okay, again, I'm not expecting you to follow the whole entire thing, but we want you to get a handle, or if you like, a flavor or a snapshot of the type of problems that we can analyze um, in, in taking a course like this. So we start off in the initial equilibrium here where we have LM1 equals IS1, okay? That's that point A, right, where we've got um, Y star, full employment, and interest rates of one, okay? Now, only six months ago, 10-year bond yields in the United States were over 2%. Now they're about 0.8%, okay? Interest rates have collapsed. We're seeing this big decline in GDP. The data is saying, in this model should show us a big decline in interest rates and a big decline in GDP. Let's see if it does. Now what we've seen here has been a massive demand side shock, okay? These economies shutting down, people stopping spending, people not stop going out, out to restaurants and, 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 and bars has led to this IS curve moving radically to that point B. Now that's the shock. We looked at shocks in the aggregate demand, aggregate supply curve. But what about the authorities? Are they just going to sit by and let, it, let, let that go? No. What we've seen is easy monetary policy. The LM curve shifts to the right. Easy fiscal policy. The IS curve shifts, shifts to the right. Now, the central bank has been trying to maximize the effect. This deals with issues known as fiscal multipliers. Maximize the bang for your buck on this by keeping interest rates constant, not in letting interest rates rise with, the, with these policies. And in doing so, we avoid Great Depression level unemployment, such as Y2, which is that point B, so Y2 minus Y star. And we end up with a period sort of a, of, of sort of, you know, intermittent mild recession until, you know, a COVID-19 vaccine is, 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 is found. So authorities have done the right thing. We avoid the worst case scenario B, but we end up with, you know, the best worst case, which is, which is, which is, which is that point C. Okay. So here we are. This is the punchline. Can China reset to explosive growth? Remember, this is a speed dating 30 minute, 30 minute discussion assuming zero ec economics. So here we are, let's put it all together. So like, first of all, let's look at the, the structural and then let's look at sort of the near term, right? So China's long-term growth rate was slowing already before COVID-19 due to diminishing returns to capital due to overinvestment. And because of demographic change, the impact of the, of the one child policy. It had also been done by design to try to improve the quality of growth. The trade war is leading to deglobalization as supply chains shift to ASEAN. Vietnam is a major beneficiary, okay? Um, Mexico is a, is a major beneficiary. This affects the long-term growth output potential of the Chinese economy. Now, the things that China's gonna do to try to offset that, we've talked about the investments that they're making, but these are factors that have taken place. Again, the policy of transition is one focused on the quality of growth, not necessarily quantity. Um, we've seen policies to try to minimize these structural forces, such as the Belt and Road Project. We also do that case study in my, in my, in my uh, course. Structural supply side reform and state of enterprise reform, which we also deal with in my course. That's trying to offset some of those structural forces. 
Now, COVID-19 is a negative shock to Chinese aggregate demand and aggregate supply, as we've talked about. It's both a supply-side shock and a demand-side shock. It is a perfect storm. Resetting to the 1978-2012 growth rate was not going to happen even before COVID-19 due to those structural reasons. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. As we've mentioned previously, there are risks involved, financial risks involved, systemic risks involved by running the economy too fast for too long and building up excesses in the financial system. Xi Jinping and his, his economic advisors totally understand this. Okay. Now, the aggressive monetary and fiscal stimulus has avoided a Great Depression, in my opinion. Now, I was quick to make this call back in 2008 when I was running my hedge fund, um, right in the middle of the, of, of the crisis, that the decisions that are made there were going, to off, were going to prevent a Great Depression. I was right then. I think I'm right now. I'm pretty sure. So China's growth rate should remain below potential. The risk is that we get a second wave. Um, uh, but really, until we see you know, a vaccine come back or a, an effective treatment, then we're going to have you know, a, a cautious rollout um, of, of both the demand side and, uh, and also the production side of the Chinese economy. So, you know, it's not all gloom and doom, but I think we need to sort of temper our, uh, our, our views here. So I'll stop.